Hey, thank you very much to Jane, to Catherine and Megan. And thank you to all of our career panelists who've been doing some sterling work today. Now, you may hear, if you're, if you're listening in, you may hear the kerfuffle, the chitter chatter of voices. You may hear the munching of a canopy, the chinking of glasses, the fizz of champagne. <laughs> there is a good reason for that. Susie. Yes, we're here at the Space Park Leicester. This brand new facility is just being launched today. There are a lot of guests downstairs, including Major Tim Peake, who's come to unveil the Space Park uh, today and give a nice speech and uh, we're having our celebrations today so, so if you people have just day. yeah people have just joined in what's going to happen at space park leicester what's it all about this is a brand new building in the heart of leicester and it's designed to bring together academia uh, and the space industry to bring together sort of a wealth of knowledge and experience and opportunities for the future designing and building new space missions and looking at earth observation science and how we can monitor our fragile planet uh, and look after disaster management and all sorts of other things. So it's an exciting place uh, for, for the space sector in the UK. It really is. And it's a beautiful building as well. And I feel quite chuffed that we were the first people to muck it up. We, by were, doing, yes. we were doing lots of demos earlier on with, <laughs> yes. uh, with some schools. And we got flour everywhere and cocoa powder everywhere. Launched some and, rockets yes. and all manner of things. So, so. we've already, we've already uh, ruined the carpet here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're having a nice time. Right, let's... Um, who have we got next? I think it's time for a bit of space history. Yes. You know, when I think of Mars history, you know who I want to get on? I want Jim Green from NASA. Absolutely. Because I can't think of anyone better to talk us yes, through yes, the yes. history of Martian <laughs> exploration than former uh, NASA scientist Jim Green. We do. We have uh, Jim Green and he'll be talking with Professor David Southwood. So, Jim, David, are you there? Yes, right. I am. Hey, hi, hey. hi Jim, welcome. Jim. We wish you were here. You're missing canapes and drinks. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Yeah, tell me about it. I wish I was there too. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, That's indeed, funny. space history of Mars is pretty spectacular. I mean, what we're finding out about Mars is unbelievable, but it wasn't always as easy as it looks today. So if I if I may, let me uh, share my Straight screen. Straightly, we've uh, lost you, Joe. We can't hear you, but hopefully we've still got you on the, uh, on, on the live feed. So we're going to just let you... We're going to let oh, you carry right. on. Take it away, okay. Jim and David. All right, good. Thank you so much. Right. I hope, can you hear me now? Well, I can hear you, Jim. All right, then maybe the, right. let's just have a conversation about old times. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's great to see you. Great to see and, you. Uh, okay, so you want to fire away and uh, I'll take yeah. you off afterwards. Okay. All right, let me just uh, start out by sharing my screen. Uh, let's see, uh, can everyone see uh, the graphic? It looks good to me, but uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to confirm. Okay, well, let's talk about the, uh, the missions that have gone to Mars over the years. You know, the very first successful mission was Mariner 4 by NASA. Uh, and, and that turned out not to be our first attempt. You know, Mariner 3 didn't make it. Uh, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, this shows in this graphic that's uh, laid out is uh, each of the nations, uh, uh, the Soviet Union, United States, and then Russia, of course, Japan, China, ESA, India, United Arab Emirates, Italy, and Canada, their missions are arrayed in a way that uh, we can see some of them are flybys, some of them are orbiters, some of them are landers, and some of them are rovers. And it, 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 it turns out this looks like a scattered set of things that we're trying to do at Mars, but actually it's pretty methodical. Uh, uh, NASA's approach has always been, let's fly by, see if we see anything interesting, then figure out if we wanna go back or not. And if we do, let's orbit it and let's get high resolution imaging and then decide on getting down to the surface. Yeah. I, I'm going uh, to so, interrupt you, Jim, yes, because please. the thing you're missing out is, okay, let's fly by and, oh dear, we did we miss the planet, or oh dear, we had a failure. I've got to say, well, if, I mean, really, still I think it's only about half of the times we've been to Mars, that we've been successful. Now, yes. we're doing much better now, but it was the Death Star for 
for the United <laughs> States and indeed for the yeah. Russians and everybody yeah. else. Everybody for else, yeah. Many years. In, in, indeed, I think the total number of missions now uh, is 60 in terms of their elements. You know, if you got an orbiter yeah. and a lander, that would count for two things. And out of that 60, 27 of them have been failures. So Mars is hard. And as you can see, Mars is hard from the very beginning. And uh, even though in this more modern era, we're, set, we're having much more success with only a few failures, uh, it still is a very tough, tough planet to, uh, to get to. So indeed, that early part with many failures uh, going on uh, at both the Soviet Union and NASA were trying over and over and over again. And it really got down to uh, uh, several successful flybys like Mariner 4. Uh, Mariner 6 uh, uh, was a failure, but then 7 and 8 were great. And 9 turned out to be our very first orbiter. And, and this is where I sort of come into the picture. Uh, Mariner 9 was successful when I was at the University of Iowa taking a course on solar system physics. And uh, we all had to do term papers and presentations. And mine was Mariner 9 data. And how does Mars look more like the Earth or more like the moon? And it turns out Mariner 4 made Mars look like the moon. We flew through the southern hemisphere part, to, took about 25 or so pictures, big craters. Man, it looked like the moon. How depressing is that? But Mariner 9 gave us now much more of a, from an orbital perspective, really fabulous vistas, just beautiful vistas. And in fact, uh, when we arrived with Mariner 9, it was during a dust storm. And so that went on for many months. And as the dust began to settle out, certain features popped up. And the first feature, feature was, was this caldera from um, Olympus Mons. And uh, at the time it was called Nix Olympic, Olympica, uh, but now it was really clear that it was gonna be a shield volcano. Now this shield volcano was absolutely enormous. I mean, the. The, the central caldera is, is like 85 kilometers in diameter. You could stick the entire District of Columbia, okay, in that, in that caldera. I think there are and people the, who might want to do that, actually. <laughs> I don't think you should make that suggestion too often. <laughs> no, no, but it just occurred to me today how big this thing is. Plus, plus it's like at 82,000 feet. I mean, we fly jets across the country, across the ocean at a 35 or so thousand feet, but not at 82,000 feet, yeah. you know. So everything on Mars is big. The canyons are big. The shield volcanoes are big. You know, the, the, everything is just enormous. And part of that is because the, the planet has less gravity. And so there's less of an opportunity for those kind of things to get crunched down and, and, and be smaller. So this early era, uh, uh, I view, ended with the Vikings. And, yeah, and no, I the, recall that. I was, in, um, I was yeah. in the U.S. at that time in 1976, I guess. And uh, I think it was even launched. I mean, was it launched on the 4th of July or it landed on 4th of July? Very uh, patriotic. An awful yeah. lot of hoopla about it, <laughs> and uh, you know, Uncle Sam was going to discover life on, on Mars. Uh, it, I mean, it worked. Uh, I, I can recall the landing. I can recall the dust storms as well. Uh, so, how did you feel about biking? Well. Uh my interaction with Viking during that time uh, as a young magnetospheric physicist, I, you know, I, I didn't stay so much in planetary as I sort of mm. branched out, you know, uh, as a magnetospheric physicist, I never met a magnetic field I didn't like. And of course, <laughs> we, we, we now know that Mars didn't have a magnetic field today, but it did in the past. So that's very fascinating. But my connection with that was with Jerry Soffin who was a, 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 one of our original astrobiologists in the agency. And he was, he was bound and determined to do everything he could to make those landers successful looking for life. And they had three major experiments to look for life. 
And unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we landed uh, both Viking 1 and Viking 2 landers in relatively safe places, or at least we thought they were. There's huge boulders all around. It's amazing we didn't crash into one. But, uh, but they landed safely. They're not rovers. And they dug in the dirt and they brought material in and they looked for chemical composition changes uh, based on uh, certain reactions that they were uh, initiating inside the rover. And they had made a decision that all three instruments had to give positive results that they found life before they would announce it. Okay, and that's before they landed. And of course, only one showed the chemical reactions that could have indicated metabolic processes uh, from, uh, from a potential microbial life. And that was through the labeled release experiment. And so that PI wanted to declare we found life on Mars, but the others said, no way. <laughs> I, uh, I, it really is a difficult thing, this business of actually declaring you found it because it's an enormous emotional thing, isn't it? Yeah, to, yeah, it uh, is. I, I, I had a similar experience later on with Mars Express when we found methane and formaldehyde. For me, that convinced me we were looking for something that was there. Uh, but in fact, we held back for exactly the same reason, that we, we weren't absolutely totally 100% yeah. certain. And I think that probably is the position we're still in, isn't it? I mean... It is, it is, it is. I, I yeah. have to say, I, I always had in mind this promise that Viking would find life if it existed. Uh, I it's funny, I went through the same experience with you, with... <laughs> thinking Mars initially looked like the moon and oh boy I've yeah. been there I don't you know that's enough then real you know seeing Olympus Mons and realizing this was something else so I, I absolutely echoed your feelings but then with Viking I think it's a fine example of where you have to be careful what you promise because what happened after Viking it very little. Was, yeah. Yeah. Until, it was a disaster. Uh, yeah. I mean, it took it took 20 years almost. Uh, almost. Yeah. But for um, so I think that that's a point about science, isn't it? You have to be yes. you may get very excited yourself at what might happen, but don't declare it has happened until you're absolutely certain or you're going to be really in trouble. Yeah, well, I, That's right. I came in probably on the next Mars missions. They were, I don't know, do you remember Mikhail Gorbachev? He of was course. the leader of the Soviet Union. And of course, he made friends with your president, President Reagan. But the first Western leader to make friends with him was Margaret Thatcher. And... Um, under her auspices, I was sent off to Moscow to set up cooperation with the Soviet Union on two really dramatic Mars missions. They weren't to Mars, they were to a moon of Mars, Phobos, which is, uh, uh, it just seemed, and we would, you know, that the Russians were gonna do things that, if you like, sounded a bit science fiction. They were going to fire a laser at uh, Phobos uh, in order to find out what it was made of and things like that. It was all, and of course, we'd be orbiting Mars with the moon. So it was definitely a Martian mission. Uh, but I have to say, it was extremely interesting, very exciting, great to be working with the Russians. It was a very, you know, this was the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Right, that's right. One felt, you know, very and um, exploring Mars. That's for everybody, you know, whichever side yeah. of the Cold War you were on, exploring Mars is important. Anyhow, in the end, I'm afraid both missions failed. One, one got very close to the target to uh, Phobos two, 
but it was another disaster. And so yeah. really, we didn't really recover from that until I think it was Little Sojourner, the, ro the right. rover that you guys sent up. Uh, now, when was that? 19 that was uh, 96. 96, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so from 75 to 96, you know, NASA years. just kind of yeah. stepped back. Yeah, and, and, and we, we had all kinds of failures too. So it, it also shows that, that you know, if you build up a capability uh, to do these hard things, walking away and then coming back, you have to recreate that capability. And you're going to make some of the same mistakes or new mistakes that uh, you, 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 where the experienced crew that you used to have uh, is no longer there uh, and able to help you. So ag again, this middle era of exploring Mars started out having a number of mistakes. And in, and in that period of time, there were nine failures and six successes. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, well so, that's, uh, <laughs> that's really the wrong way around. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, but Sojourner, I think that got, got the public imagination. Um, it did. Probably it, it did. was because it was very small. You had this little object landed successfully on Mars yeah. and it moved. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It went from rock to rock. Yeah. So, so a couple things had to be invented. All right. So Sojourner indeed was this microwave sized little rover uh, and, and sitting on a platform, it was decided that it, we'd have to have a platform to, to land it in. And so they stuck it on the platform and then to protect it, they would put these, uh, these panels over it, creating a pyramid shape. Then to land it, how are you gonna get that down on the ground? Is it gonna be retro rockets or whatever? Uh, the engineers felt that, hey, let's use uh, airbags, uh, airbag concept uh, with Kevlar. Double ply Kevlar were the bags that we used. And, and so as it was coming down, after it, it was in a heat shield, we dropped the heat shield, then we dropped the, the, the pyramid with these Kevlar bags around it. They got inflated and then they would bounce many times, I think uh, 10 or 20 times. Uh, and then we deflate the bags, keeping the pyramid upright. And then we would open up uh, and Sojourner would roll off. Yeah, And well, it was that, that, indeed that, pretty spectacular. I, I it, it grabbed my imagination because, <laughs> you know, you, you, you get to Mars and what do you do with this tiny little sensitive item that's gonna really deliver everything back. You bounce it around. <laughs> I mean, it must have been, what sort of height did it bounce to when it first? Uh, oh, I, 30 or, or more meters. I mean, yeah. it just really bam and comes right up. And, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it, and of course but, it's, you're trying to take that momentum away. But the terrible thing is you could have claimed to have landed on Mars 20 times. Yes, true. You never thought of that, did you? <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, you're right, uh, and we didn't do that. <laughs> we made that made that mistake then. Yeah, yeah, but, no, uh, hey, but I mean, I just was amazed that you know it was a new technique for landing. Yeah, and it, was. it worked. I mean, it, yeah, was, it was. Yeah, uh, but it's that's one of the. I mean, Mars is difficult to land on, and the reason is. It's got enough of an atmosphere to be a nuisance, yes. but not enough to be a great deal of help. You know, <laughs> when you're landing on most, well, if you're landing on a planet with an atmosphere, sure, it get you, your spacecraft will get very hot. So you have to be very careful to make sure you don't burn up. You've got to go in at the right angle. You've got to get rid of the heat. But at least then you can open a parachute and drift down gently to the surface. Mars doesn't let you do that. No. And I think, you know, Mars is the tough one from an engineering point of view. If, uh, well, I think it's obviously so from the scientific point of view, isn't it? It, it, it is. It is. And so the, 
the next big concept because of the success of Sojourner was how big can we make our rovers and still land them with airbags? Since we got the airbag working, that concept working, you know, the next big thing then was going to be uh, let's land another one uh, with their with airbags. And that turned out to be a uh, spirit and opportunity. So we ended up with two. And that was because Dan Golden had decided, um, uh, let's hedge our bets. We're not doing so good. We have failures. And, and that percentage was, uh, uh, as, as we've already talked about, greater failures than successes. Let's launch two and hope that one works. Okay. Okay, so, I'm going to interrupt you because I got okay. a story myself <laughs> from that same year, 1996. Yeah. That was the end of my career working with the Russians. <laughs> but it led, it led to something great in Europe. Uh, after the failures of Phobos, I think we were very worried the Russians might pull out of space science completely. Wow. But no, no, they came back. Uh, yeah as Russia, because the Soviet Union finished. And uh, we, did, we did a program that was called Mars 96. It was, uh, but it involved Russia cooperating with a lot of European nations. Um, so- Yeah, uh, that was a big mission. I mean, it, it was, was not enormous. small. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was an enormous mission. No, it was gigantic and it had- Yeah, it was. It had an absolutely beautiful German camera, the stereo camera. And, you know, it was, you could see Mars through two different eyes and that gave you a three dimensional view. Well, that was going to. What wow. happened, it never left Earth orbit. Uh, oh, it was, that was a disaster, really sad, but because so many, Western European nations have been involved. The uh, ESA was dragged in by the, the governments of those countries and said, why isn't ESA going to Mars? And anyhow, you've got to show those Americans you can do things as well. So rather cheekily, because it was the era where we did everything cheaper, faster, better right. uh, in Europe, we decided to do the cheapest Mars mission, <laughs> Mars Express. Now that was great, Orbiter, we could use all these wonderful instruments and I guess the wow. images we got, I mean now uh, the American images are very similar, but the images we got, those three dimensional images were just staggering. But we tried, we, because of you Americans, I think, decided we had to have a lander. And of course, <laughs> the, uh, we're of course today being hosted from uh, Leicester, from the Space Center. And that was where our ground station for the lander was gonna be. So it's very sad. The lander Beagle 2 was built by the British. Yeah. It landed successfully on Christmas day a uh, few years after 1996 in 2004, uh, 2003, excuse me, Christmas. But then it couldn't call home. ET failed to call home, probably due to Martian dust in my view. Anyhow, let me get back to you because All right. a few things happened in between times. You've already- It did, it spirit did. And opportunity, but- uh, well, as, as you said, uh, your, your work with the Russians on, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mars 96 had its problems. But, but now we enter also the Japanese with Nozomi. Yes. And Nozomi uh, was going to get into orbit, uh, it'd be an orbiter. And it unfortunately uh, uh, missed Mars. Uh, they weren't able uh, at the right time to... Uh, to acquire the signal and get it to uh, to fire its rockets to slow down enough to, to for Mars to grab it and put it in orbit. So now we're seeing more of that international participation. But indeed, uh, the um, fabulous uh, spirit and opportunity both worked. Now we felt that that was they were only going to work a short period of time because what we gathered from Viking 
even though they were Viking, the Viking one and two were nuclear powered. So we didn't care if dust fell on it or not. We always had enough power to keep it warm and run the experiments and, and that work. But um, because we were building these two small sized rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, using the airbags. And so these were less than 200 uh, kilograms in, uh, uh, in, in mass. Uh, and so consequently, we were going to use solar energy. Now, the solar energy on a, on a planet that's dusty means that if you get enough dust on the solar panels, you're going to starve it of power, and then it'll eventually freeze, and then that will end it. And so our current estimate is, uh, once again, and we were conservative, uh, we didn't want to <laughs> overstate, uh, that uh, we felt, felt that we could get 90 days you know, two two missions on the surface, 90 days each. Uh, if we, one of them worked uh, for 90 days, then we would declare it a wild success. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like I can hear what you're going to say already. Go on, say it. <laughs> wow, were they successful? Because uh, Spirit operated for six years, an opportunity uh, for 13 or 14 years. And and went huge distances, you know, uh, you know, more than a marathon, you know, uh, uh, in terms of being able to visit places and and do that. And and they went to two very different places on Mars, exploring areas of diverse uh, uh, minerals. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the areas we see hematite all over the place, which is an uh, it's an iron. And uh, in, in water uh, creates this uh, iron oxide we call hematite, uh, which is a fabulous mineral. We, we, we can find them here on Earth all, all, all over the place. And, and therefore was hematite on the surface, which means water had to be there. Uh, we also, uh, you know, uh, with uh, opportunity, uh, went to fabulous craters. You know, uh, uh, Victoria Crater was just this unbelievable beautiful crater that we could get the stratigraphy if we we if we came down one of the crenulas and then and then looked at it and made measurements and and saw uh you know much more about uh, the mineralogy of mars and so i think uh, the, between spirit and opportunity we were able to cat categorize about uh 250 or so minerals that really gave us an understanding of uh the fact that uh, Mars was very much like Earth, uh, all the same minerals that uh, they found we have here on Earth. So they were tremendously uh, successful. I, I, uh, no, I recall that. I, but I, I mean, I at the time, of course, was uh, at the European Space Agency and having to make the case for things like Mars Express and so on. And I had to make the case that orbiters were quite as important as anything crawling around in the dust on the surface. And so for me, uh, I still think you need the orbiters to get the planetary picture. You've got a whole planet there, and uh, there is so much depends on the luck almost of where you land. And yeah. I, I mean, you know, we discovered um, the the wet history of Mars. I mean, Mars, right. certainly, we're looking for water now. And indeed, again, we found it under the surface. Uh, I think the likelihood of just randomly drilling under the surface and finding water is somewhat low. But we had a radar that uh, could see beneath the surface of Mars, and we could look across the whole planet. So, uh, and, you, and of course, America came up with a whole series of orbiters, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. that actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that brings us to that modern era. Yeah. You know, uh, this is a tremendously successful era uh, where, and indeed the orbiters are actually very critical. Uh, you know, high resolution imaging enables us to look for locations uh, that we can land uh, safely in, uh, uh, you know, and so that that next big step in terms of landers was was curiosity. 
And of course, at that time, I became a head of planetary science and curiosity was now something I had to execute. Okay. Uh, we also had to pay for it. <laughs> I also had to pay for it. Yes, I did. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this was quite the challenge. And, and the reason why is uh, curiosity is uh, uh, one metric ton. It's not 200 you know, uh, kilograms. It's over a thousand. All right. So it's, and it's as big as a, uh, uh, an SUV uh, with uh, significant uh, uh, instruments uh, on it, and uh, indeed designed uh, to tear up material, bore holes in soils, and bring those soils in and taste them and get the elemental composition. You know, it's a really tease out does Mars have everything? Uh, that Earth had early on in its history that then could have started life. And as you pointed out, our missions have really discovered that Mars was a blue planet early on with an enormous amount of water. You know, we think that two thirds of the Northern Hemisphere was underwater and in some places uh, greater than a kilometer and a half. So, uh, so a significant amount of water. And then it went through rapid climate change and lost, and lost the water. Yeah, so that's, curiosity. That's, yeah, I think that point about the climate change is something that always I bring home to people who yeah. say, well, why don't you worry about the Earth? Well, actually, I do worry about the Earth. And Mars is an example we don't want to follow. Right, exactly. What's, what's happened on these planets could happen here. What's happened on Venus can happen on Earth. What's happened on Mars can happen on Earth. We really need to study. The, we, we're so lucky to have them, you know, uh, one further away and one closer to the sun and, and really study how they've evolved over time. And, yeah, because uh, they must and that, have started off as alike as three peas, peas in a pod, really. Yeah, um, they did. I mean, you, you yeah. wouldn't have been able to tell, uh, you know, a billion years yeah. after the formation of the solar system, which one was going to deliver civilization as we know it, Jim. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, That's I, a realization uh, we've just now yeah. come to. You're, you're right. And the, the, the odds of one in three aren't that great, actually. <laughs> yeah, but thank goodness for the one, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's better than zero in three. I'll buy that. But um, yeah, so, so go ahead. Yeah, now, now, now with curiosity, you know, uh, the calculation turned out, well, we can't land it with airbags. And I'm, what do you mean you can't land it with airbags? You know, just make them bigger. No, it won't work. They'll pop. You know, we, we, we can't do it. Yeah, well, so you came that, up with something. You, I've got to say, around that time, I was uh, still uh, working at the U European Space Agency and we were looking for a way to land the ExoMars rover. If yeah. we built it, how were we gonna get it down on the surface? Exactly the problem. And in the irritating way that Americans sometimes have, you just said, hey, we've got the answer. <laughs> and I was shown a cartoon of, well, the crane, I mean, the, Tell us about it. That that seemed yeah. to be absolutely crazy. And, it, uh, it was. It was. Yeah. It was uh, uh, at the time. Mike Griffin, when when we when we showed him how we were going to land Curiosity, and he got it. He said, "That's the right kind of crazy." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, so how did that happen? Well, the concept is, you know, we're gonna we're gonna start out inside a capsule. All right. And then that capsule is going to hit the top of the atmosphere of Mars going uh, 7.8 kilometers per second. And what's inside it has to go centimeters per second to land safely. So you have to take all that momentum up. So as the capsule hits the top of the atmosphere, rather than a, a, an attack that's nearly perpendicular to the surface, the attack was such that we, we, we started uh, flying parallel to the surface. So you, we first blow mass off the capsule in such a way that 
that cocks it such that it's running as parallel to the surface as you can possibly get. This allows it to kind of streak in like a meteorite coming into uh, to Earth, okay? You yeah, know, I would have worried you, were... you might bounce off. I mean, that must have been a, <laughs> yes, yes. a serious you possibility yes. if you got that wrong. Yeah, you got to blow the mass at the right place. The, yeah. you, you, the atmosphere has got to capture it, and then you yeah. can blow the mass, cock it, and then run yeah. parallel to the ground. Then it got to the point where, okay, you're really done with that. Now you got this huge mass of a heat shield that's no longer dissipating the heat. It needs to. Let's drop it. So you drop the heat shield. Now you can pop a chute. Now the chute, the chute is enormous. I mean, it, you could stick the chute over a a, a, a house. You know, it's yeah. it, it's like 70 meters in diameter. It's unbelievable. How do you test? Of, how do you test it was going to open? <laughs> I mean, I, sorry to be a cynic, but I mean, I asked these questions more than a decade ago of you guys. <laughs> Well, and I was uh, wrong to even be suspicious it might not work. I mean, no, no, you me. were you you were right because uh, I was really worried about it too, and we were supposed to launch uh, Curiosity in the 2009 window, and we weren't ready. Uh, Ed Weiler and I, you know, were going back and forth, and finally, Ed Ed and I decided uh, with mostly Ed. Uh, nope, we're not going to launch it in 2009. Let's fess up that we can't make it. Okay. So there were just too many miracles that we had to perform. And, and one of them, of course, was this huge, this huge chute that we tested inside a, uh, a big, huge wind tunnel at, uh, uh, at uh, Ames. And the first time we tested it, we tore it apart. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not, I'm not a good so start. much better about my skepticism. <laughs> yeah, not not a good. Start. I don't think not you ever told start. me about that one before, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a couple others that we'll reveal today too. But in any event, the 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 next thing is is after you take the shoot, you then get to the point where you're about seventy or eighty meters above the surface, and you're about ready to crash because you're going too fast. So the decision then is. You've got to lower the rover, but you can't just lower it. You got to drop it. So we dropped the rover. Now that's the sky crane. And here's, here's the concept. With spirit opportunity in Pathfinder, you land with a lander and the rover on top of it. But with curiosity, the center of mass on a lander is too high. It will tip over. So now that means take the lander and not put it underneath the wheels, put the lander on top of the rover. And then if you put it on top of the rover, you then can have retro rockets that slow it down and let it hover. And then we're going to do something like we do here on Earth with helicopters, raising and lowering supplies all the time, every day. We're gonna draw. We're gonna roll the rover uh, down on uh, wires until it touches. Now that's a that's a really delicate procedure because the rover is all folded up inside the capsule, and so as it's lowering, we got to extend the legs. We got to you know lock in the wheels. You know we got to do all that as we're lowering it to the surface, and then when it touches down. Uh, it, we blow the the lines and the sky crane flies away and crashes. We don't we can't use it anymore. It's done, and then the <laughs> rover's on the surface, and it works. I, I mean, it's a wonderful thing, and uh, you know, I just love the idea of the jump jet on Mars. You know, it uh, yeah, it really, and that's been the big. I mean, that's been really the way that you've gone from then on from landers. I mean. It's uh, right. It's been a great story. It has. But, so this this modern era, it, it, including Curiosity, but also Insight, another lander that does make seismic measurements, which which has got a fabulous UK instrument on it uh, that measures Mars quakes. 
Yeah, I think you might mention the institution that provided that. It's, uh, it's called Imperial College. Yes, indeed. I won't give any clues as to where I work, but <laughs> sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm. I'm the last are because... a difficult thing. I mean, I that was another thing I discovered with Viking, is the device that was supposed to be the seismometer detected the whole shaking of the lander. <laughs> Right. In the wind, because the winds were so high. There's no atmosphere, but you've got a high wind. I mean, very little right. atmosphere, but uh, very high winds. And uh, so actually making a seismometer work on Mars is not a trivial job. You've got to protect That's... it from the wind and you've got to firmly embed it in the surface of Mars. But I mean, That's right. Mars quakes are coming, aren't they? Yeah, I think we. Uh, I think you guys have measured about eight hundred different uh, events, which is mm. fantastic. Yeah. And indeed, we learned what not to do from the Vikings. Don't put the seismometers on the legs. Put it on the ground. Yeah. And 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 indeed, uh, Insight uh, did a great job, and uh, it's working uh, wonderfully with all kinds of information about the size of the crust, the core, and the mantle of of, of Mars. And then, of course. This last year, uh, February of last year, uh, we, we landed Perseverance, uh, which, uh, which right after we landed Curiosity, I started working on. I was head of planetary and I thought, okay, now we're gonna get some samples. Everybody wants samples. And so uh, Perseverance was designed uh, to core rock. So uh, the core is uh, a, a cylindrical drill that drills right into the rocks and then we break it off and then we stick it in a tube and that tube is uh, sealed. And then, we, then we're gonna set these on the surface for later pickup by another rover. Uh, so, so the concept of bringing those samples back is incredibly important for several reasons. One- you do? You're gonna uh, do it with us Europeans, aren't you? Yes, we are. Yes, That's we are. Plan. Yeah. That's the plan and it's coming together nicely. Yeah. I mean, uh, just uh, just making the making the samples is uh, going well. We've got seven samples right now, six rock samples and one uh, atmospheric sample, and we have uh, forty three sample tubes that we'd like to completely fill uh, before we finish. And then of course um, we we've tried something new, which is the helicopter ingenuity. I yeah, I was gonna written. you you. I mean that is an amazing. I have to say, shame on me. I uh, I'm on the advisory council of JPL, you know, your planetary science center. And yes. when I was told about this thing, I said, you know, <laughs> I love the idea. But again, uh, I put it up there with uh, 70 meter parachutes. And, uh, <laughs> In fact, it's probably, it looked on the face of it even more impossible to fly something in an atmosphere that doesn't exist. I mean, tell yeah. us about it. It's worked. It, it does. It's like flying a helicopter at 120,000 feet in our atmosphere. Well, we don't fly helicopters at 120,000 feet. What are you talking about? You know, yeah. that's the same pressure uh, and temperature. As, as the surface of Mars. But, uh, you know, so uh, JPL proposed it. We didn't accept it right away because it hadn't really proved itself. In fact, uh, Mimi Ong, who is the project manager, was so excited one day coming into my office and shows me the first flight in a vacuum chamber. So what happens in the vacuum chamber, so here's one you don't know either, is, is, it, is it starts to come up and then goes right to the wall. <laughs> and she was so excited. <laughs> yeah, it just crashes into the wall. And she was so excited. And I go, Mimi, Mimi, it can't be doing that on Mars. We don't want it crashing into Perseverance, you know? <laughs> and she goes, oh, no, no, we, we, we understand what's happening. The fact that it actually had a lift to it means we're on the right track. And man, she was right. Yeah, uh, we now have gone. I've got to say, the only demonstration flight. I saw, it went up vertically, but I guess yeah. that was specially prepared for NASA headquarters. 
<laughs> yeah, that wasn't the first one. I saw the first one, and it went right okay. to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're, you're letting all the secrets out today, Jim. <laughs> that's a wonderful story. But, uh, yeah, so that's really going to be is, a uh, critical element of future, future exploration, we, isn't it? Yeah, we, we think so. We now believe we can supersize it. Okay, you know, you, you go to McDonald's and you want them large fries. Well, we do too. And, and, that, and that means uh, uh, it's a four pound helicopter. We think we can get a 40 pound helicopter, okay? Now we can put many more instruments in it. Uh, you know, right now it has a forward looking camera and a downward looking camera and, a, and, and an altitude sensor. But with the 40 pound uh, helicopter, we think we can do methane sensors. We can do temperature pressure uh, in addition to uh, uh, even, uh, you know, some small uh, mass spectrometers. So uh, it's, it's really part of our future strategy. Okay. Listen, I think we're running out of time. Well, um, yes, I think we are. We haven't, we haven't landed people on Mars yet, but uh, I think perhaps we should pay attention to some of the questions we've been getting. Yes. Can, you, can you hear us okay? Yes. yes, we can. Uh, so sorry, we, we, it was so noisy. They're having a big party downstairs. We couldn't hear you earlier. So we've had to move into the, into the library where it's a lot quieter. I uh, see. Okay. But it's been really, I, it's, you guys should have a comedy podcast together. <laughs> <laughs> we love listening to your stories. We did not know about the uh, initial issues with the helicopter. So that's, that's fascinating. It's, to been, listen uh, to. it's been great. I'll tell we you. One day I'll tell the full story and we'll get oh, Jeff yes. to tell the tell full us, story. Tell us first. I mean, we're, we're just lifting the curtain on that. <laughs> just, We've got a few shout outs to start yeah. off with, actually. We've got a, we want to shout out to Mrs. Briggs at Delta Dart and Steam Club. Hi, Mrs. Briggs. Hi, Mrs. Briggs. And also a shout out to all of those. In, in well, Bogota, Colombia. Who've joined so, us. Hello, from, hello to Colombia. Uh, and loads of questions for you. We won't have much time to go through them, um, but but yeah, we've, we've had loads come in. Yeah, actually, one of the questions that came in, which I thought was quite interesting, we talked a lot about the, the, the missions that weren't successful, but how, as scientists, when when a mission isn't successful, how does it, how does it make you feel? I mean, obviously, you, you can learn a lot from failure. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, no, no. I mean, it's about the most... I guess there are more depressing things, but not that have happened to me yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really right. is awful. Um, you know, you burst into tears. You really, it's very hard to deal with because you, you work on something for years and there it's all gone. And it's, um, there's no, uh, no cure for that. Um, I mean, you just have to that? work your way through it. Yeah, one of the ones in Beagle 2 was the one that you mentioned. And for a lot of people, that'll be one that sticks in the mind. It was very, very close to working. It was a very small thing that sort of let it down at the yeah, end. That's, that's almost a good thing and a bad thing. Yes. It's <laughs> a good thing. I mean, for me, the saddest thing of all was uh, the man, Colin Pillinger, the man behind Beagle 2, did not know that it successfully landed. And therefore, yeah. his team were the first to successfully land first time on Mars. And that's because Beagle 2 decided not to call back. I mean, Beagle 2 didn't call home. But that's the good thing was success in landing. The terrible thing was not knowing what had happened. Uh, and then it's even more terrible that Colin never knew. Uh, How long did it take to, to, to work out what had happened? And to, to well, we, we, we didn't work out what was uh, <laughs> such. Well, we NASA required, has imaged it. Yeah, we, we had to get an image. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we, we had we've an imaged image. it. We had yeah, an image. Yeah, it's sitting on the surface. Yeah, we, we found it. It looked like Mickey Mouse uh, because it was, and that immediately told you something was wrong because. It looked like the profile was a circle and then two other smaller circles like Mickey Mouse's ears. There mm -hmm. should have been three. Three. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, 
that we we put Mickey Mouse down on Mars, but it couldn't call home because yeah. the third yeah. ear didn't open. I um, yeah. it is. <laughs> we had all sorts of analysis and uh, afterwards, and there are always the things you worry about, and uh, actually that the antenna not opening to communicate back right. wasn't really on my list of things that would have gone wrong. So yeah, right. I'm afraid that's another lesson. You can't go up there and kick it to make it work, nor well, maybe can we'll you can find out why it isn't working. And there's yes. a team uh, still at the University of Leicester, in fact, who, uh, who bear the scars, but uh, yeah. really did a brilliant job. I think that's Great. really Thank important. You. Thank yeah, you. They did. They did. All I, all I can say is maybe one day in the future, Mark Watney will find it and then open that other pedal. <laughs> we can hope. We can hope. Uh, we've got another question for you. Actually, we've talked a lot today about the history of water on Mars, and you, you mentioned that earlier as well, and how we know that there was water on Mars. We haven't talked much about magnetic fields, but there's a question here about water and magnetic fields and how we know that the, or how the water disappeared, why it disappeared. And I suspect also linked to a question about why Mars's magnetic field disappeared. So maybe someone would like to have a go at that one. Sure. Oh yeah, mm. delightful. Uh, yeah, it, <laughs> indeed, uh, MAVEN, which is now orbiting uh, uh, Mars, uh, it was designed to look at the solar wind interaction with the planet. Also, Mars Express is making some of those measurements. And we're seeing that, uh, uh, indeed, uh, those two missions are telling us that the solar wind is cutting up the atmosphere and, and, and blowing it away. And so that's because it doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it. Now, it did at one time. And we can determine that it had a magnetic field. And it's a strong field because we can, from orbit, measure the remnant field in the rocks that were originally lava that then cooled during the time when the magnetic field was there. And therefore, that magnetic field gets trapped in the rocks based on how the atoms align in the matrix of a cooled uh, rock. And we can see that from orbit. I mean, it's phenomenal to think that you can see a remnant magnetic field uh, from orbit. But we've done that too. And so um, uh, we now know uh, that uh, that magnetic field must have been very important uh, for, for keeping the atmosphere intact in the, on the red yeah. planet. And you can bring that back to Earth again. The Earth's magnetic field matters to us. Uh, yeah. We, want it. we don't want this, that to run down the way Mars is. Yeah, the, the, David, this is a very perfect point because we know uh, potentially our magnetic field will flip again, yeah. you know, and when it flips, we'll be in a position for which there'll be very low, if not hardly any field that'll be protecting the Earth. And so all the physics of how the solar wind interacts with the upper atmosphere and ionosphere that we see at Mars will happen at Earth. And so this is another great reason of why we do comparative planetology. Why, I, my I'm not sure I want to live on that planet at that time. <laughs> how did, why did the water disappear? I mean, From that, how does the water go? So if we don't have a magnetic field to protect, oh, I see. So then the solar wind can strip away the atmosphere. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so what happens yeah. is a, a water cycle, uh, you start with uh, a, an ocean, you have evaporation, you have transport, you have rain, that's a cycle. What happens is you break that cycle. Once you break the cycle and then the, the, the uh, uh, atmosphere is full of water and then the sun starts to ionize it, uh, if the solar wind starts to strip it, then you don't, you interrupt that transport and you don't put it back in the ocean. Got it. Very well explained. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are we doing for time? Oh, well, gosh. Yeah, we don't have much time left, actually. Probably time for just one more. Uh, we've got a sure. question here about um, whether sort of popularizing Mars through things like movies, like The Martian, has increased the public's interest in Mars. And does that translate towards increased funding for research projects at Mars? You want okay. to take that one, David, Jim? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it, it turns out I ended up being NASA's consultant on the movie The Martian, and uh, oh, what I really liked about project. it. Fantastic! That's the best job title it, ever. 
it, it was, it was. Uh, uh, and uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And one of the reasons why I was so excited about it is Ridley Scott wanted to make it as realistic as possible. And man, we gave him whatever he wanted. Um, and uh, the sets were great. Uh, how how they how they worked that was wonderful, you know. And so it's it's science fiction, but it's what we call hard science fiction. There's a lot of truth uh, in what we know and how that look and feel of uh, of the astronauts walking on Mars uh, and uh, what they would have to do to be able to survive because it's a harsh environment. Now, relative to funding. Uh, NASA connects to the National Academy and the National Academy talks about what are the things that we need to do. And then it's up to NASA to say, we know how to do those things. We can pull them off and we just need the money to do it. And Congress has been tremendously responsive in allowing us uh, to meet the objectives of the National Academy. So we've worked really hard and that process seems to be working great whether there's successful movies out there or not. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you I so much. That, oh, sorry, David. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to add to that. I think uh, one of the great things about Mars exploration in the, in the US has been it's independent of political party. It's, uh, it really has been most important uh, for the last nearly 30 years. Yeah, right. It has. That's been yeah. really so important for us to maintain yeah. stable funding and keep our programs going because of the yeah, support we get from Congress. Yeah, these missions are over long time scales, aren't we? These exploration yeah. programs. Yeah. We're just sure are. Jim, you're going to be joining us later on tonight, I think. You've got another show. You're yes. going to be talking. You're carrying on your the Martian theme. You're going to be talking about the history of sci-fi Mars, which I'm looking forward yeah, to. Yeah, looking right. forward to that. Good.